Welcome to What If Geography. We are back after a rousing two episode series on housing inside the United States, but you know, I think it applies to a lot of other places. It was a really fun episode for us to uh, to record. Um, and now we're going to go into something maybe a little more lighthearted, a little more fun, a little more um, on track, so to say. Uh oh, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're gonna. Yeah, so. Uh, I mean, obviously, you all see the the title of this before you listen. So, you know, broadly that we're going to be talking a lot about um, high speed rail within the United States. And, you know, we're really framing it as, you know, what if the United States had a high speed rail system? Because there's a lot of impacts, right, Hunter? That's right. I mean, there's a I mean, we'll get to the what ifs, but things I think that we're going to conclude are things would be quite a bit different in a lot of ways. Um, and of course, before we get to that, we want to break down, you know, how we've gotten to the place where we are now, where we sort of have high speed rail. But, you know, our yeah. what if is what if we had extensive high speed rail? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to I mean, as usual, I think if you're a regular listener, you're probably no surprise here. We're going to dig into the history um, just to get at sort of how we got from being such a dominant rail country um to where we are today which is you know rail is still a lot of places but not a lot of it's used for passenger rail service and there's a reason for that yep but before we do that let's get some introductions um hunter why don't you kick us off great i'm hunter shoby i'm a professor of geography at portland state university i'm also the co-author with david bannis of a couple cultural atlases one is called portlandness a cultural atlas and the other is upper left cities a cultural atlas of san francisco Portland and Seattle. And there's a bit about transportation in those as well. So some of the things that we're touching on today, you can probably find in there. Uh, and of course, Jeff is a contributor to these books as well. Yeah. And as usual, uh, if you look in the show notes, there's a nice little link to, um, I've been using IndieBound, the IndieBound link. Yeah. That um, has got links to various places, I think. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I figured that was a good aggregator. So if you're interested in those books, take a look at those show notes um, and you can jump in um, and I think take a little bit of a closer look at, at sort of the content in there. And then hopefully you like it and you buy it um, because they're fun books to have um, just around cities and place and culture and everything like that. So um, my name is Jeff Gibson. I am the co-host of this podcast. I also run a YouTube channel called uh, Geography by Jeff. Uh, where I do more geography things just on a shorter and more concise um, level. Um, they're fun to make, um, but I also am not able to get as in-depth as I would like to, um, which is the whole point of this podcast. Uh, so um, if you want to watch some of those videos, please do so. You can find it at youtube.com slash little at sign geography by Jeff. That's a geoff, G-E-O-F-F. Um, you can also find me on Substack at geographybyjeff.substack.com or on Instagram, and that's instagram.com slash geographybyjeff. Um, broadly, you know, just find if you're if you're interested in me, find me. You can find me elsewhere. Um, at this point, you can probably just Google me. Um, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> let's keep this moving. Uh, so we have a couple sort of housekeeping things uh, before we dive into today's episode. So what do we got first? The first is um, we have received our very first ever one star review on Apple Podcasts. Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah. Which um, I'm taking as a good thing. You know, and I think we, um, you know, maybe somebody didn't like sort of the sort of some of the bents that we take, which is, um, you know, usually grounded in history or. Well, that's all right. People have different opinions of things. So people have different opinions of things. I think. Um, you know, we have never really made this plea in the past or sort of this, you know, call to action. But uh, if you do listen on Apple Podcasts, I don't know how much it affects things on Apple Podcasts. But if you enjoy our content, please review us. Please rate us um, on that. I think um, it's nice to see that, you know, we get, I don't know. And I don't know, to me, it's like it's nice to have that next level of interaction, right, where somebody's like, you know, purposefully going and sort of saying, yes, I like this and I'm going to rate it, you know, whatever stars. Um, so, yeah, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please do that. I don't think you can review on any other app, on any other podcast app. Um, but if you can on your uh, podcast app of choice, maybe do that as well. Consider it. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the next thing is to... Um, so I've I've had sort of an idea sort of floating around in my head just as have we been growing as we've been growing this podcast. Um and you know, I, 
I sort of get floated questions here and there uh, through sort of Instagram messages or just on email. Um, you know, I'll have people ask me, you know, various, you know, specific things like, well, what do you think, you know, about X or Y? Okay. Um, I think what would be fun is, and maybe it'll be a nice, like sort of side episode series that, that we do is to have sort of like a quote unquote, ask a geographer series. I don't know if that's going to be the title, but, um, but that's the idea. That's the idea, right? Cause you know, Hunter and I, we sort of talk and live and breathe this stuff, uh, just because we love it so much. And a lot of people have questions about this stuff. Um, and they have questions about their world because they live in their world. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, this is probably not something that's imminent. However, if you are interested in, um, asking us a question, we are probably going to start pulling those together and starting to pull together maybe some mini episodes, um, around sort of just answering people's questions and, at some point, there will be a more formalized location for this. But for now, if you want to ask a question, um, you can email me at jeff at jeff at what if geography dot com. Um, I will just start compiling them. I don't know how many questions we're going to get. Um, and I'm certainly not going to promise to to answer your specific question. I Again, I just don't have any way of knowing what's coming in and how many is going to come in. But, you know, I think it could be a fun exercise and um and it'll help give us a sort of a different kind of sort of episode, which sounds compelling to me. It sounds like a good opportunity <laughs> to get some interaction in a in a medium that's a little bit challenging to do that with. So this could be a good way to achieve that. Yeah, I think so. I think it's I think it could be fun. Um, hopefully, you know, I think, well, you know, I don't know what to think yet. We'll see. Um, <laughs> you know, we'll keep you updated. We'll keep you updated. I think if if. If and when this happens, um, you know, we'll probably try and do our first episode um, in like a month or so, in which case, you know, it'll probably premiere sometime in March because usually we're a few weeks out. Uh, right. Not that that's any surprise. We're not recording this live <laughs> in case you think we are. <laughs> um, OK, well, with that, let's start talking a little bit about, well, we'll we're going to talk about high speed rail, but now let's go back in time. Let's just talk about broadly about uh rail um so hunter i'm going to kick it over to you just first thing what do you know about the history of rail in the united states well i mean i know a little bit more now since we've done some of this research <laughs> and i guess a lot of what i know about early rail is outside of the united states because i teach about globalization and this kind of stuff and i know mm -hmm. that the railroad played a super instrumental part in the industrial revolution uh, and urbanization and, you know, in the UK and in Europe and then beyond and various other places, but including the United States. So I know that the railroad had a really big ro a role in transforming the economy and the uh, horizon for you know, different possibilities for transportation. You know, before you, if you want to go to the West Coast of the United States, you'd have to either take a very long, arduous journey across the country in a coach, stagecoach kind of thing, or get on a boat and go around the tip of South America in order to get to the West Coast. So this really, you know, part of what I know in a very broad sense is that it really changes things quite significantly. Right. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to tackle all of that. Um, yeah. The um, the the trip across the country or around the the Cape of or what is that called? It's not the, not the Cape. Is it called the Cape in South America, that, that end point? Um, no, that's Cape of Africa. That's Cape what you're thinking. Yeah, of. that's yeah. what I'm thinking. Of. Well, sort of the, the, the end point of South America, um, you know, either one of those was, you know, it was very hard on everybody involved. And um, and we're going to talk about how this, how the how rail really changes that in a little bit. Um, but first, before we do that, like, I want to go back way back in time because we like to think of rail as being an 1800s technology. In fact, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, jargon out there, you know, particularly around people who don't like rail infrastructures, you know, it's a, you know, whatever 19th century solution to, you know, whatever. Um, I happen to very much disagree with that, but you know, we, uh, within the popular culture, we think of rail infrastructure as being a 1800s piece of technology. However, um, we can go al almost all the way back to the 1500s to get, sort of some early forms of rail, um, right? Yeah, no, I think that's true. And I think we're talking at this point about 
rail that's you know constructed with wooden tracks, uh, wooden wagons, and this kind of stuff. I'm going back into apparently the 1500s in Great Britain. Um, so if we wanted to, you know, go back really far, we we you know we'd be talking about that. Of course, we're talking about something a little bit beyond the wooden track thing. We're talking about steel tracks and this kind of stuff. But even right. then, it goes back further than you might think. Right. Yeah. So you know, I have you here in my notes that the first recorded rail infrastructure uh, was uh, was in 1720. That was up in Nova Scotia. Um, it was used to build a uh, a fort of some sort. Um, for I'm going to guess the French, although I, I don't know when the you know property turned over to um, Great Britain at that time. Um, but this was the so this was what I could find is the first recorded rail infrastructure that was sort of on steel sort of beams. Um, okay. it probably doesn't look quite like what we know. Um, what we think of as rail today. Um. But the, the the idea behind, you know, using steel was that when you have, you know, a steel wheel on steel sort of relatively flat uh, steel surface, um, you greatly reduce friction, which is sort of the the whole advantage of it. And it's why rail is still so much more efficient than basically all other means of, um, of, of transportation to, you know, get from long, long distance transportation, I should say. Um, though it's worth noting that this particular rail was not um, powered. Um, it was, uh, it would be called a gravity railway, which is, um, what is well, just like ima- imagine, right? It, yep. You know, you, you have to pull something up hill, then you can get it back down pretty easily. Right. Um, so there are efficiencies involved in that. And so, um, that's sort of when rail really started to, um, I guess be seen as, you know, some sort of viable tool, but it certainly wasn't being used for travel, um, necessarily. This would be. I, again, I wasn't, obviously I wasn't there in 1720. Um, but you know, my, what I'm guessing is that, you know, using it to pull tools or materials up and down v- sort of very areas. limited distance kind of thing. Right. Very, and there's probably some pulley system. So like in order to get something back up a hill, you know, you just sort of have a pulley and you sort of crank this thing and it sort of drags up. I don't know if that's, again, I don't, I don't know exactly if that's how it worked, but I can, I can at least envision how the early mechanics would work. Um, but, you know, well, that's all well and good and very interesting. So we can talk a little bit more about the early, early history of rail. Um, we are just going to go ahead and jump to the 1800s because that is really when rail as we know it today forms, um, which is by powered and by moving people, you know, through great distances. And we're still using a lot of those tracks as well. And we're still using, if you can believe it, yeah, we are still using a lot of tracks that um, are are very old, which is impressive, very impressive. Um, it, I think it goes to show the durability of some of this, not to say that a lot of this track hasn't been repaired over time, um, but it does show the durability broadly of the technology. Um, you know, if you have a, you know, let's take a, a road, a highway, right? Um you know, roads and asphalt and, you know, whatever your, your city might use. Cause I know there's some cities that use, you know, different materials. Um, that, that, that has a shelf life of only a few years before it needs to be repaved. Um, again, rail does need to be fixed and replaced here and there. Um, but broadly, I think it's proven to have been much more durable, um, to the point where, yeah, I think there's, there are segments that are still broadly the same piece of sort of metal rail infrastructure yeah, it's remarkable yeah it's remarkable yeah it's i mean again i think this the i think the reason for this not to get, get too much into the technology but, you know, i'm not a i'm not a scientist or a mechanical engineer but you know i think broadly it is because there's it's steel wheel on steel beam there's just not that much friction overall um and so there's just not that much that actually causes um degradation aside from um just the really long lifespan of of steel, which is an incredibly durable and hard material. Um, so let's jump to let's jump to the 1800s. Talk. Um, I think I just have a note here um, that by 1850 there was uh, there was already over 9,000 miles of rail within the United States. Most of that, of course, uh, on the East Coast. Yeah, almost entirely. I think yep. there's there's some fun maps out there you can see you can sort of poke around sort of through the decades. Um, rail fans, if nothing else, are very passionate 
Um, and so a lot of them have done some For really sure. great, yeah, yep. they've done some really great uh, mapping and sort of um, and and data gathering. Um, I would con- count myself as as one of them at this point. Um, but yeah, so 9,000 miles of rail by 1850, most of it in the, the East Coast. I think at that point, there was a little bit starting in sort of the Central Valley, San Francisco area, um, but very, very small. And I think um, the the thing to like realize, I think a little bit about sort of this rail infrastructure, I think a lot of people like to, like to think that it was, um, you know, it started in one place and sort of grew out from there and became sort of everything was sort of connected from the beginning. But a lot of this rail infrastructure was really patchwork. You would see like a 20 mile stretch here, but it wasn't, wasn't connected to anything. Right. Um, or even shorter or maybe sometimes longer, but like a lot of it was really kind of patchwork. Um, and when those connections did start to come together, it was very concentrated in the Northeast because that's, that dates back to industrialization that dates back to moving materials back and forth between factories. It wasn't, as much to move people around it, it became that later on but it was really moving freight around yeah yeah and we'll talk a lot about the northeast um i think um maybe later this episode certainly next episode um the northeast has certainly been a um a big part of where rail infrastructure has been focused and i think it's i, I think it goes to industrialization i also think it just goes to the fact that and you know this ties into industrialization and urbanization but you know, you have New York City, you have Boston, you have Philadelphia, and you have, you know, Washington, D.C. The you know, at that this point, you know, I don't know how big Washington, D.C. was in 1850 or, or even up to 1900. Um, we might need to go back to our Washington, D.C. episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's certainly becoming it's the nation's capital is becoming a bigger city. So all of these cities are relatively close to each other. Right. Um, they're just there's a there's a density of cities and people in a sort of industry um within really you know a single corridor which is now broadly you know called the northeast corridor um and so um so you see a lot of rail infrastructure sort of come into play out there um but then you also see rail infrastructure come to another place and that is chicago Um, absolutely yeah chicago 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 grows very quickly in the second part of the 1800s and becomes uh, an important economic engine for the country and for driving what was happening on the East Coast as well. So eventually, when the connection is made between New York and Chicago, it allows things to be brought to the East Coast where there, most of the population of the United States was at the time from Chicago. And we're talking about corn, we're talking about meat. Uh, and this goes into the 18 into the 1900s. And so Chicago grows really quickly in conjunction with the railroad. And it really transforms the Western United States, the Eastern United States. It transforms the country. Yeah. I mean, I think St. Louis was maybe like officially termed the gateway to the West at some point. But I think in my head, Chicago really does at least claim it at least deserves a little bit of ownership of that that title. Um, and I have a fun like sort of, you know, quote here. Um, uh, so it's all rail leads to Chicago and sort of a play on sort of the the term all roads lead to Rome, which was, you know, based on sort of the Roman Empire and literally every road, not every road, but, you know, most of them would connect back to the capital of Rome in some way. Um, if you look at, well, I, if you look at rail maps today, a, a modern day rail map, um, but if you even going back to the 1850s um, or late 1800s, you can see most rail is heading right into Chicago. Um, and then it sort of balloons out from there. It's like everything has to connect there and then it'll go back east to New York um, or something to that effect. Um, it, or it'll come from you know, the West Coast. You know, if you're looking in the 1900s, um, it'll connect all the way into Chicago and then, you know, head south or north or, you know, continue going on east. Um, but it really was impressive. And I, I think a lot of, um, well, I don't know, this isn't an episode about Chicago, but I think a lot of, to your point, there the growth of Chicago is due to rail infrastructure specifically. It has a lot to do with that. Um, and to give you an illustration of how it transformed people's ability to get from place to place, in the early part of the 1800s, to get from New York City to Chicago would take about five weeks if you're going by stagecoach or something like that. It was a very long trip. And once the railroad connected the two cities, 
that trip could be done in a couple of days. And so, you know, that's, that's time space compression right there. The yeah. idea that through, we could be talking about communication, but in this case, we're talking about transportation through uh, innovations and in technology related to transportation, our experience of the world starts to shrink. The world doesn't actually shrink, of course, but if you can get someplace in two days that used to take you five weeks, that's, that's a big change. That's transformative. Yeah. It's, it's monumental. So that's, so I get the time, time, uh, time, space compression theory, um, is perhaps one of my favorite theories around, um, ge geography theories, um, mostly because it ties so much into transportation, which is a big passion of mine in general. But yeah, literally, um, you know, if you're, if you're, if something takes you a week to get to today, but then tomorrow only takes you, you know, a day, uh, that's a monumental shift in how you are perceiving your access to the world. Um, and that's kind of like rail, maybe more so than anything since the, you know, the airplane um, was what transformed people into thinking of how they're accessing and getting to places in their world. Um, because, like, you know, like we established at the very first part of this episode, uh, going to the West Coast was really arduous and really long and was quite frankly very very dangerous um and then the railway and a very specific railway came along and we'll talk to talk about in just a second that really did enable the growth and the migration um of people in a way that wasn't really ever thought of as conceivable um even 20 years prior even 10 years prior right even maybe a year prior <laughs> no absolutely until it's finished, it, that, that that connection doesn't exist. And then after, it starts to change things greatly. And of course, I mean, this is probably a good time to raise that this is all happening on land that's Native American land. Right? Correct. And so um, this also spells increased um, grabbing of land and decimation of na Native American populations, uh, eventually the almost near elimination of the bison, the buffalo, mm -hmm. um, you know, the meat industry transforms the Western United States where you have cattle from Longhorn, you know, cattle from Texas driven up to the Western United States. Then it gets brought into Chicago and slaughtered and brought to the East Coast. And this is, you know, this is chronicled in lots of history and, uh, and, and lots of books like The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. There's also mm -hmm. really amazing book about the transformation of Chicago, the, the growth of Chicago and the transformation of the Western United States called Nature's Metropolis by William Cronin. And it's a very thick history um, that has a lot to do with the railroad as well. Yeah. And so we, we've already started to touch on this, um, but there was one railway that really enabled this connection. Um and if you're if you're you know from the United States, you probably learned about it in, in the history books at some point um, growing up. But it was the Transcontinental Railway, um, which was and I, I actually don't have it in my notes, but I'm just pulling it up. Um, it looks like the last spike ceremony at um, at Promontory Summit, Utah, was on May 10th, 1869. That's um, right. And this really, I mean. We we call it the Transcontinental Railway. Um, this this specific railway was didn't actually begin on the East Coast and go all the way to the West Coast. Um, it really started in um, looks like in Iowa um, and moved west, where it met up with the um, the western half of this um, railway. In um, it looks to be somewhere outside of Salt Lake City or whatever. Yeah, north you know, was, north yeah. of the Great Salt Lake. Um, mm -hmm. this is a railroad, the, the continental railroad that began during the civil war in 1863. Um, it is a railroad that involved, uh, that a lot of the, the individuals who are involved in constructing this were Chinese laborers. Oh yeah. Um, and so that was hugely involved in building this and also ended up getting some of the 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 most dangerous jobs so when the when going through the sierra nevada mountains for example you know building building the tra the railroad through granite um through tunnels involved drilling holes into the granite and then stuffing either gunpowder or nitroglycerin into them and then exploding them and so this is fantastically dangerous very slow 
Um, other groups of people that were instrumental in building the Transcontinental Railroad include African Americans, mm-hmm. Irish and German immigrants, Civil War veterans, um, and these were some of the main groups of people who who did the work to make this happen. Yeah, I I, I don't think you could be underscored just how, geez, just how dangerous this really was. Um, you know, let's take nitroglycerin for example. Um, nitroglycerin, if you're not familiar, listener, is hol- uh, very volatile, highly volatile, um, to the point where it's, you know, I think it's there's jokes floating around on various, you know, sitcoms and whatnot, whatnot um, but where you really can't even shake it, it'll explode. Um, and so, and I, I believe nitroglycerin uh, is what goes into TNT. That might be the T, the N in the TNT, um, which again, TNT very very volatile right dropping one of those is a is is a bad idea um and so yeah they would use laborers that weren't highly valued um there's actually a really good picture um it's an illustration obviously um on the Wikipedia page for this but you know obviously it's dated back to um you know the late part of the 1800s um that just sort of shows um you know some of the tr- some of the treacherous conditions of this train um, building, you know, it's going through it's either in the Rockies or the Sierra Nevadas, but you know, it's very cold, very snowy. Um, this was a incredible sacrifice that, that these people made um, in order to really provide for their families back home. That's right. Cause, and, and, you know, they were paid poorly, they were treated badly, but this was work that they could obtain, that they were allowed to obtain, um, and so, you know, it's, it's pretty important to acknowledge that part of the history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't have any stats in front of me, um, around sort of the estimate amount of, you know, people who died or, or were seriously injured by this. Um, you know, it, it was a lot. Absolutely. Um, I probably should have looked at that a little bit more, but, um, I think it's just, it's one of those moments of, that we like to here in the United States, you know, think of the, you know, American exceptionalism sort of idea, you know, Americans can do anything, you know, so long as they put their minds to it, Mer- Americans being people from the United States in this context. Um, and, you know, it's really, you know, thinking about it, it's, you know, okay. Yeah. The industry, you know, the, <laughs> the, the people funding it, you know, had a vision, but on whose backs? Um, Cause it broadly was not, you know, people at the time who would be considered, you know, United States citizens. It would be all the people we've already mentioned. Um, but that said, the the first transcontinental railroad uh, happened, and it's you know it exploded the growth of of the West um, because again, if we go back to talking about the time space compression theory, um, suddenly a multi month trip. A dangerous trip um could be completed in um I, I there was a there was a stat here um it was a number of it was a number of days i think it was you know maybe like seven days or something um and we're probably talking about san francisco to new york at this point. right exactly yeah so yes this was the the stat i'm thinking of um was literally from um new york to san francisco um and so that again that's that's pretty monumental um it, you could drive that in a short amount of time today, but it wouldn't be that much faster, um, right? You a, a cross country trip is going to take you at least a few days. So we're already thinking, you know, back in 1869, um, you know, not not talking about planes, but you know, land transportation being at a similar, um, uh, or at least conceptually similar sort of speed as uh, driving is today, which is, I think, very impressive. Um, well, they were, yeah, the, the way I guess this was set up from a business standpoint, which is sometimes the part that gets emphasized is that there were two different railroad companies that were charged with constructing the railroad, one starting from Sacramento, California, um, and then moving east, that's central Pacific and then union Pacific building tracks west from Omaha, Nebraska. And so part of the way that they're rewarded for building this is they're given land by the U.S. government. Of course, this land is Native American land, which Mm -hmm. is then given to the train companies and the train companies still have this land. 
Um, and so that that will be important for part of our conversation later as well. Right. Yeah. And so I think, um, well, actually, you know, it's already time for an ad break. So. Is it time? All right. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. already time. Um, so we're going to do a quick ad break. We're going to come back. And we're going to start talking a little bit more. We're still going to be doing history, but we're going to start talking a little bit more uh, specifically about passenger rail transportation transportation um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So uh, listen to some of these ads and then we'll talk about that. We'll be right back. We're back. Uh, so we just left the Transcontinental Railroad. We're going to jump ahead just a couple more decades to more of the late 1800s. Um, and I think, you know, I say this for every episode. We we cover a vast amount of history in a relatively short period of time. Um, you know, we talked about this with with our housing episodes. Um, there are books written on very specific subjects of rail history in the United States specifically uh we are this is highlights <laughs> right if this were a a railroad podcast then we would spend you know several episodes on a short period of time but since we're talking more generally about things you know we get more detail than you would be able to get in a 10 minute youtube video but mm -hmm. there's still limits to this so we're we're just trying to, to hit a lot of the highlights to contextualize uh, the what if that comes at the end exactly and so with that, um, you know, I kind of, like, let's just dive right into um, some of the big names of this era. Um, so okay. these would be sort of who we would consider today to be sort of some of the big railroad barons at the time. And there's really two names that I kind of just want to call out. There's a lot of names. There's a lot of railroad ra railroad barons at the time. Um, but there is um, Henry Vanderbilt, um, which is not an uncommon name to hear float around today. But even another one, which is um, J.P. Morgan which is a name that we probably hear quite often these days because, um, well, there's J.P. Morgan Chase, which is a big multinational bank that a lot of people deal with every single day. Um, and this kind of goes back to just how powerful these railroad barons were at the time, that they still have such an incredibly powerful legacy, even lasting into today. Um, but really what I want to talk about with respects to these two people um, specifically was that they were sort of instrumental in organizing um, what they would call conferences. Uh, but they're not the same kind of conferences that we would think of today, uh, which would be, you know, a bunch of people who work in the airline industry go to the airline conference just to sort of network and talk and learn about, you know, whatever's happening in the airline industry. Um, this would be, and maybe there was a little bit of that, but this was really a place for these uh, railroad barons could go and they could meet with each other so that they could, um, you know, set do things like set prices for, you know, how much they were going to charge to run freight or people back and forth between Chicago and New York City. Um, which, sounds, which creates a monopoly of sorts. Exactly. Right. You know, you say it, you say it one one way and it sounds like, oh, yeah, maybe that makes sense. Um, but then you quickly realize, oh, wait, that's price fixing. Um and so um, this wasn't illegal back then, if you can imagine it, um, but it did spur Congress to uh, uh, enact the very first antitrust legislation to prohibit the monopolies of railroads to basically stop all of this. And that that came about in the uh, it's called the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Um, and if you haven't heard that you know, act before, um, I'm, I'm, I would actually be a little bit surprised because it's, it's a pretty monumental piece of legislation that is still quoted very often today. Uh, when we start talking about monopolies, um, it was the, um, it was really the antitrust legislation of the United States. It's kind of still is. Um, so the U S government used the Sherman act in 1901 against union Pacific. So that sort of forced it to divest itself of a number of its, uh, holdings that it had acquired over the, the previous decades. Um, I believe it was also the Sherman Act. If you just go back to um, was it the 80s or 90s that broke up uh, Pacific Bell, uh, Pac Bell. Um, I believe that was the act that they used to say that, no, you need to break yourself up because you've become too dominant um, of a player. And the idea is that it inhibits any kind of true competition to happen. And that mitigates what are supposed to be some of the benefits of the capitalist system is, is competition. And so that's why... Congress enacted antitrust legislation, uh, and it's still on the books. Right. And so, you know, and there's some very key 
metrics. This isn't this isn't a law podcast, so you know I can't get into like the details. But I know there's some very key metrics within how the Sherman Act gets used based on um, really its impact on the market and consumers more so than anything else. So you know a lot of people like to you know float around as something being a monopoly here or there in, in sort of various capacities, um, and so they you know I think a lot of people want the 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 U.S. government to you know clamp down on them. You know, Amazon, for example, as being a uh, monopoly. Um, maybe there's something there. I don't know. But I I do know that the, the federal government has very clear guidelines based on this act of how they can use it and when they can act on it. So um, in this case, you know, going back to rail, um, the Sherman Act uh, Antitrust Act was used against Union Pacific, which is still a railroad company today. Company today. Yes, it um, is. A very big one. Um but it's not the only one, <laughs> which is maybe, um, you also know, true. Uh, the power of of the Sherman Antitrust Act. <laughs> um, this also sort of spurred the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Um, so this happened actually um, a few years before the Sherman Antitrust Act, but it's sort of this this idea of these railroad barons sort of agglomerating and buying different things. Um, so it was founded in the uh, by the U.S. government in 1887, and the ICC indirectly, this keyword there, um, indirectly controlled the business activities of the railroads through um, various regulations. Um, but it wasn't it it didn't have a forceful hand. Um, so I think the Interstate Commerce Commission was broadly seen as maybe being a way to rein in some of these early railroad barons. Um, but it wasn't that powerful and it didn't really have that much um, uh, power to actually enforce a lot of a lot of things that it wanted. Um, and we we won't spend too much time on 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 the Interstate Commerce Commission. They might pop up again later in the episode. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's a pretty monumental without with without these railroad barons and without uh, rail in general, you know that's a huge part of you know the u s. legal framework system that you know, would not have existed. Maybe it would exist in some other form, but not in the way that it does today. And so do we have anything else on the 1800s? Because I kind of want to jump um, to the 1900s at this point. Yeah, I think that sounds good. I think All we've right. gone over a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just there's so much there's there's a wealth of stuff. And I'm trying to like, you know, keep us keep us moving. Um but also do things justice <laughs> where I can. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and jump to, um, you know, the early, you know, 1900s. Um, and at this point, you know, by the 1920s, the rail industry, that that's when we start to first see the rail industry start to decline. So it had been, it had been a very dominant form of transportation for the obvious reasons that we've already established um, through throughout the 1800s. Um, but the 1900s brought, to other pieces of transportation technology, right? Um, Hunter, what are, what are those? Well, we're talking about the automobile and we're talking about passenger jets. And um, <clears throat> they're, I mean, if we go into the you know 1880s to the 1920s, seems like sort of a golden era for the railroad. We can mm -hmm. go even into the 1940s, but after the 1940s, we really see a, a high uptick of car ownership after the end of World War II. And then also the ability of more people to afford airline travel as well. So by the 1940s, there's a really marked shift in what's going on. Apparently, up until the 1940s, a lot of long distance travel was still happening in the United States by rail at speeds of between 40 and 65 miles per hour, a lot of it. In the 1930s, you get diesel streamlined trains that were replacing previous trains that can uh, go a bit faster. Um, so even though the technology is still increasing and still progressing with the trains, it becomes difficult to compete with the car and, and airline travel. Uh, and we'll have to evoke another episode here. And we talked about the, the interstate highway system mm -hmm. and the adoption of an interstate highway system for which the federal government pays for most of it is one of the things that has a really big impact on the train industry. Right. Yeah. So so when when we go back to the 1920s, you know, that's that's really when when things started to decline a little bit. Maybe it maybe it even just flatlined. Um but that's also when we started to and I again I can't remember the exact date, but if we go back to our interstate highway system, that's when Congress started to basically 
funnel money over to highway infrastructure. Um, so yeah, post little... war 40s and 50s. There's a yeah. number of acts. I think by mm-hmm. the 1950s is when it really starts to uh, progress dramatically uh, quickly. Right, and and at the time, you know, a lot of these railway companies were, you know, basically, you know, well, that's not fair, right? They're, you know, the federal government's propping up, you know, airlines and and you know, this nas- these two nascent transportation industries. Um, but also, you know, rail had its moment where <laughs> it was propped up heavily by the U.S. government um, throughout its early years too. Um, I think the 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 biggest point to make here is that, um, you know, rail started to decline in in the 1920s um part of that was due to uh the great depression um part of that was due to um i know during world war one um all rail was briefly nationalized um so that you know i'm not going to say that you know it should yeah i'm not sure exactly what led up to that moment there might have been some very real reasons to um but i think whenever you have a jolt to the system like that it does make it harder for things to pick up steam again um to, <laughs> to borrow a pun oh boy. that's where this comes from right this is where these expressions come from there's something else here that happens transportation wise that we've i think touched upon a a little bit in some of the other episodes but that is the transformation of how public transportation works uh, within cities and within metropolitan regions Mm -hmm. and so the um the acquisition of public transit systems particularly particularly by National City Lines, which is uh, an organization, a company that received equity from General Motors, Firestone Tire, Standard Oil of California, and Phillips Petroleum, um, started to buy up a lot of public transportation lines. Some of them were sort of in decline already, but other them became in decline because the idea Mm -hmm. was to transfer transfer the main way of transportation working from electric rail lines, lines within cities uh, to bus lines and to right. internal combustion and this kind of thing, and also promoting, you know, that goes hand in hand with promoting interstate highways. The inter- the National City Lines company was active in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and this sort of fits with an earlier comment. Um, was was convicted of conspiring to monopolize the sale of buses and related products to local transit systems uh, in, in 1949. So that antitrust sort of anti monopoly legislation comes back. Mm-hmm. And um, you know the way that transportation working within cities has has a factor in this as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, and so, like, so let's talk a little bit about uh, World War II because there's two things that sort of come out of this. Um, it's obviously it's a monumental moment for the world, um, uh, for a lot of different countries for a lot of different reasons. Um, World War II, during the the World War, that was actually a brief uptick, um, significant but brief uptick in in ridership on passenger rail. Um, But that was primarily driven by sort of, you know, troops having to move across the country, um, as well as uh, gasoline rationing, right? Um, You know, a lot of of resources were being poured into the war effort, obviously. But World War II also did something to... Um, not not to the U.S., but uh, to other countries um, that really paved the way for the rail infrastructure they have today. And that is it largely demolished Europe, China, Japan. Um, And certainly all three of those have a lot of rail infrastructure. We'll get to that in a little bit. But two of those in particular got kind of an early start in their rail infrastructure, which is Europe and Japan. And Japan in particular launched um, their first high-speed railway um, called the Shinkansen in 1964, which is a direct, well, I don't know. I, I think it's a. I think it was a pretty direct um, route from sort of the rebuilding of the country after World War II. Absolutely. And the same thing with Europe and Japan is that uh, in the United States, for for many people, incomes and purchasing power is increasing pretty dramatically and that takes longer for that takes longer to happen in Europe and Japan mm-hmm. and so not as many people are able to afford vehicles and that's one of the factors that it, we can attribute to uh the development of and reinvestment in rail in those parts of the world in fact the start of the European Union if you go back in history into the early 1950s starts as the European coal and steel 
um, association. I can't remember what the what the last mm-hmm. part of that is, but the idea is to reduce tariffs among some of the uh, main countries in in Europe, the main economic powers, I should say, um, so that they can rebuild railroads. Right. And so you know, this is something that is a very different direction that happens in the United States, as we talked about with air travel and particularly with vehicle travel. Well, those investments are made more heavily in rail travel in Europe and Japan. And as you mentioned, um, the Shinkansen or the the bullet train, as it's sometimes called in Japan, um, was was heavily invested in and is be- and is still a very uh, has a very high profile and is used very extensively today in Japan. Yeah, and well, uh, yeah, it's so the Shinkansen is. I mean, it's it's kind of a cultural icon too, right? For Japan, but also uh, more globally. You, I mean, you mentioned Bullet Train. Um, this is kind of the original Bullet Train. In fact, there was just a movie that came out that was called Bullet Train, which takes place on the Japanese Shinkansen. Right, that's right. Yeah, um, it was actually a very entertaining movie. I really enjoyed it. Um, not because of the transportation aspect so much, but just it was a fun movie. Um, but yeah, so you, for everything you just said, right? The, the U.S., um, one, it wasn't demolished. Uh, two, it had a rapidly, you know, uh, uh, population that was rapidly increasing in, in its wealth. Um, I mean, we talked about this, you know, in multiple episodes at this point, but this is during the phase when the suburbs really start to grow, which is an, which then enabled people to buy vehicles, which then enabled the federal government to justify, you know, spending, you know, multi, multi, multi billions of dollars on a federal uh, highway infrastructure uh, program. Um, and all this, all the while that this is happening, um, rail kind of isn't doing all that much. Um, so between, you know, 19, I guess, 45, the end of World War II to um, 1965, which we'll get to in a minute, there's not really, it's just a period of really stark decline. Um, well, and then there's rail. another moment here I want to highlight here, and I mm-hmm. don't know if this came up for you in your research, but I was reading about a very terrible crash in Naperville, Illinois in 1946. Oh no, I didn't. I didn't come across and this. And so at all. Um, this was a crash between what at the time were higher speed inner city trains traveling on the same track. And so they have a train. Oh, dangerous. Yeah. It leaves, it's not that they're they're heading in the same direction, mm-hmm. but they're you know several minutes behind on the same track. And so this this particular incident occurred between the advanced flyer and the exposition flyer, which were two of the high profile trains at the time. Um the one train, I believe, let's see if I have this correct. Um, the advanced flyer train has to stop on the tracks to see because there's a problem of some kind. So they they stop and they try to check out what's going on. And then here comes the exposition flyer at 80 miles per hour. And then the, they recognize that they're going to have a collision. So they break, but you can't just stop a train from 80 miles per hour on a dime. And it slows down apparently to about 45 miles per hour, but then collides from behind. Uh, And this is an incident that resulted in 45 deaths, you know, some 120 injuries and really kind of transforms people's opinions of some way of the safety of trains as well. So one of the things that happens is that in the wake of this, the, the speed limits were set to 79 miles per hour. That's which is kind of remarkable. They thought, well, if we just go a little bit slower, it'll be okay. Um, and you know, a lot of investigation, a deep investigation found that there were a series of problems and mistakes that were to blame. But this accident had a huge impact in curtailing the excitement for high speed rail in the United States. And so that's something I think worth mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know, we hear about uh train crashes, you know, every now and then. Um you know, there was one up here in the Pacific Northwest only, you know, five ish years ago. Um, although it wasn't a fully passenger loaded train, it was still more of a testing testing route. Um, but you know, it derailed. Um, and of course, you know, that that always sparks a conversation around the the overall safety of of trains, which you know, trains have a pretty safe record, um, far higher we, than your car. Certainly. Right. And if we <laughs> what's what's remarkable about this conversation is that the number of traffic accidents and you know, deaths involving cars is very high in the United States. Um, but that doesn't really get much attention. I mean, if there's exactly. a problem with a plane, mm-hmm. which is pretty rare, right? You know they ground all the planes that, right. uh, that variety. I mean, they they 
And the same thing with the investigations that go into rail accidents mm-hmm. are very extensive and receive a lot of attention. Um, automobile accidents, they don't, they don't, they seem to be held by they a different standard. Yeah, they don't, well, they don't register, right? I mean, maybe yeah. it's just a desensitized you know, nature as long as there's been uh, really cars, you know, and mass, there's been a lot of crashes um, at a certain point, you know, you just don't cover them. Um, it could also just be, you know, there's a level of agency that you have when you um, when you're driving your own vehicle versus um, a plane or a train where you don't really have that agency. People feel like they have control. Of course, you don't have yeah. any control over what other people are doing on the road. But the exactly. fact that you're mm-hmm. behind the wheel uh, suggests that you have m- probably more control than we think we do. But it's not like being a passenger, I suppose, on a, on a plane or a train where you have zero control. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So no, I I didn't hear about that at all, or I didn't read about that at all. Um, but that you're right. That's probably had a huge impact on sort of stymieing um, some of the early developments. You know, shortly after the world, shortly after World War II is when sort of Japan started I- ideifying the um, Shinkansen, um, which then they eventually launched in 1964. Um, but then that led to um, when that happened, that that was sort of a, a little bit of a moment for the United States where um, where they saw this you know, the sort of the power of, of, of the Shinkansen. They're like, well, maybe we should actually be doing it. Let's, let's get on that too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So that, that led to, um, what was called the high speed ground transportation act of 1965. And from what I could read, it was literally, uh, in direct response to the Shinkansen. Um, uh, that's what I've read too. Yep. Um, and I, you know, and I have an episode coming out about, um, the Northeast corridor, by the time you're listening to this, this will already have been out um, for a couple of weeks. Um, this is on your YouTube channel. On YouTube channel, yeah, yep. yeah. This will be uh, this will be coming out tomorrow. Um, but so I, you know, I'm, I've been doing a lot of lot of sort of research um, on sort of the Metro Liner, which is sort of the only sort of project that really spins out of this this act. That's right. Um, and so the Metro Liner was a train. Um, that connected uh, Washington, D.C. to New York City by way of Baltimore, Wilmington, uh, Delaware, and Philadelphia, um, and could travel at speeds up to 125 miles per hour. Um, so that that that's pretty fast. Um, I think at the time, the Shinkansen trains were traveling at about 135 miles per hour. So um, it was comparable, right? It was um, pretty close. It, was, it got pretty close. Um, but the Metroliner... Um, while it was great that it happened, it was still relatively niche just geographically. And so the overall effects of this high speed ground Trans- transportation act has, has never really been fully realized. Um, and this Metro liner would eventually be replaced by sort of what we know of today as the Amtrak Acela line. Um, and I think you told me that you you had actually written on the Metro Liner, Hunter. Yeah, so I went to college. I'm from the Northeast, um, and I'm from Central Connecticut, and I went to school in Washington D.C. as an undergrad. And the the best way for me to get back and forth from home to to college was to take the train. And so mm-hmm. I would generally, you know, get a ride into New Haven, uh, take a train to New York, and then take the train to Washington D.C. Uh, and then the same thing in reverse. And I remember mm-hmm. checking the schedules and trying to get Metro liners because it would be a quicker trip. And at the time, I wasn't really registering, oh, I want to take high-speed rail or anything. I'm just <laughs> looking at the schedules and I'm like, well, this one's going to get me there much more quickly. Yeah. Um, and I also know that at the time, it stopped in New York. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's it extends now with the Acela extends to Boston, I believe. Right. Yep. But the time that I was doing this, which is a while back, I guess I'm dating my situation here. Um <laughs> But it was, and it was much more, it was much more viable than, I mean, I didn't have a car and that wasn't something yeah. I could, I could do. I think by the time I was a senior, I, w- I flew a few times because all of a sudden it became comparable to fly price wise. Mm-hmm. But you know, for the entire time that it was cheaper to take the train, I would do that. And I, you know, I like taking the train because I could also take public transportation from where I lived in Washington, DC to Union Station and then get on the train. And so, and, you know, we're going to lead up to this, but one of the things that the train has going for it is that you don't have the same wait times that you have oh, yeah. for getting on a plane. Yeah. 
yeah, we'll we'll dive into that quite a bit. Um, but yeah, I, I have it here in my notes that the scheduled time for the Metroliner from DC to New York City, sort of termini to termini, um, for the Metroliner uh was about two and a half hours. Um which was that's great. That's that's yeah. very fast. And oftentimes I wasn't able to take that because yeah. of course it was more expensive and it was noticeable. And I remember spending I feel like twice that time to make that trip. Um, and so, you know, that was the balance. Do I want to pay more and take the Metro liner or do mm -hmm. I want to just, usually I think I ended up saving money and taking the longer, the longer train. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, I think we're, since we're at this moment, there is something about taking the train for many people that's interesting. And you get in, you can move around a train pretty easily. There's mm -hmm. a diner car where you can buy something to eat. Um, and it's pretty, the, the landscapes that you see out the window of a train are fascinating. And a lot of times mm -hmm. they're, they're quite lovely and other times they're kind of gritty, but in either case, it's very interesting. And you see p parts of cities, for example, that, you know, one, not everybody always sees, uh, going through train station to train station, um, and seeing, you know, what happens close to the tracks, you know, that wasn't necessarily part of my, my living experience, but something I was exposed to by taking the train. Yeah. You literally, um, there are literally some places that you only can see from the train, right? Um, That's right. I mean, unless you're going to literally walk down the rails, which is not the experience most people will have. Um, you, there are parts, like you said, parts of cities. Um, I'm thinking, you know, of, of I've taken the train into uh, New York City, or I've taken it out of New York City, I should say. No, I, I did I, in and out. Um, and not that it's like wildly, you know, beautiful and like you get this really much, but it's just, it's a different look. Um, and you, you, and you get this in the same way through mountain, through mountain passes, through, um, natural areas that trains go to, but, um, but cars don't or, or, you know, whatever do doesn't, or, you know, obviously if you're in a plane, you're, you know, whatever, 20,000 feet above. Yeah. It's a very different way of experiencing places and experiencing mm -hmm. connections between places. Right. And so going back to the Metro Liner, so this was, um, the Metro Liner was operated independent. Um, I think it was operated by the Pennsylvania Rail Authority uh, for much of its early life, but then quickly um, was transferred over to another entity, which we are going to talk about now, um, which is Amtrak. Um, right. Well, before that, it apparently was the Bud Company, the Bud General oh, Electric okay. and Westinghouse that are involved okay. in that. But um, that was for a very short period of time. Uh, yeah, was like, I right about the Pennsylvania Transportation Authority? I think Did they have some I have that here there? someplace. I think that was sort of part of the startup. Yeah. But so the Metroliner starts in 1969. By 1971, just a couple of years later, that's when Amtrak comes into the frame. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's let's talk a little bit about Amtrak. Um, just sort of how it got started. So, um, Amtrak is really derived from uh, another piece of legislation called the Rail Passenger Service Act of 1970. Um, and so this act was signed because leading up to this moment, inner city passenger rail sort of around the country was starting to struggle and go out of business entirely. And a lot of these rail companies were obligated by the federal government to um, continue service um, in between various cities. Um, and so in order to help save this industry um, from going away entirely, the government basically formed Amtrak, um, which I have here as a fun fact, um, was originally going to be branded as Rail Packs. It's Rail P-A-X. Interesting. Um, which I think is just... Uh, so apparently from what I can read, they had all this branding for Rail Packs. It was basically a done deal until about a month before they officially launched the service and then they switched everything to Amtrak. Wow. <laughs> um, I think it was probably a, a smart idea. I don't think Rail Packs... Um, has as much of a uh it's just a little more of a clunky <laughs> name well and it doesn't reference i mean it references it doesn't reference the country it doesn't no. because mm -hmm. am is america yeah. the united states mm -hmm. and so that gives it this this flavor of of the state right some. right and so amtrak got it started but it was it was an opt-in system so we like to think of it as of amtrak today as being this all-encompassing sort of rail transportation passenger transportation system um, but back then it was, um, it was an opt-in system wherein, um, the goal was to entice these, 
inner city uh, uh, railway lines to join and and then they would receive some sort of benefits in, in exchange. So I have here just sort of a, a quick list, which is um, one, uh, any railroad operating inner city passenger service could uh, contract with the NRPC, the net, um, which was sort of the what would originally become Amtrak, um, and then join the national system. And then by doing that, part, participating railroads um, uh, would be uh, given cash or or rolling stock, that kind of stuff. So they would get some sort of financial incentives. Um, they were also freed of the obligation to operate um, uh, passenger service, right? So they were basically saying. Um, we will join. Um, we will continue running this, um, but um, we were we are no longer going to have the obligation to continue doing this. Um, now that obligation will lie with Amtrak, which if they decided to contract and move or change some stuff around, then Amtrak itself would have to fill in those gaps. That's right. And if you go um, back several decades, it's really the freight train companies that own initially passenger trains. And that's if you right. go back in earlier in the frame. And I'm looking at my notes again. And I guess the Bud Metroliners, they were the company that made the trains and the, the engines, I guess. And hmm. so those trains made by the Bud company were completely replaced once Amtrak came on um, by 1982. And they were Yiddish, using a Swedish developed locomotive that hauled coaches, the AEM-7. You know, for people who know trains, they're like, of course, you know, they, they know all these things <laughs> because people who know trains, they know a lot of detail about them. Right. You know, for the lay person like you and I, this is... Uh, these are details that we have to read about to figure yeah, out. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit I do not know the specific models of trains. Uh, totally beyond my knowledge. Um, I, I can talk a lot about sort of routes and you know where things maybe should and could and would go. Um, but once we start getting into the technology, the, it all go, it all goes sort of out my brain. Oh, one um, more thing I should know mm -hmm. um, that sort of relates to this accident, I think, which is that. U.S. passenger rail cars in the United States are heavier than those in Europe, oh, um, and if you know if it's heavier, you have to expend mm -hmm. more energy to get them to go fast. And the reason is, is because they had to. There was a mandate here in the United States that they had to be able to withstand collisions with freight trains, and oh, so they're heavier. They're also um, taller and longer train cars. Mm -hmm. And so that is another small detail that feeds into the complication with high-speed rail developing in the United States. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to talk about that in this episode, but just in a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit more about the rail, um, passenger rail and freight um, yes. sort of you know, issues there. A big, um, big issue. But let's just close out on talking about sort of the beginning of Amtrak. So, um, you know, when this first started of the 26 passenger rail service, uh, inner city rail services operation operating at the time, uh, 20 of them opted to join Amtrak. So the vast majority took up the federal government on their offer of, um, of being um, a part of this bigger system. Um, and th that would include the Metroliner. Um, so Amtrak would take over and run the Metroliner as the Metroliner all the way up until the year 2000 when um, uh, they would replace it with the Acela, which is what currently operates today. Um, they added us they've added stops including you know new termini in boston um it's still not that much faster than the metroliner um but we're going to get to that next next week i think when we talk okay, a little more good. about yep. high speed rail um and with that let's let's jump to a quick ad break and then we will conclude on sort of what amtrak sort of looks like today we'll be right back and we're back um we're going to finish up today's episode just talking a little bit about what Amtrak looks like today. Obviously, it's such a huge part of rail infrastructure in the United States um, and even up into Canada a little bit here and there. Um, so we kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about it more broadly. Um, and so we we sort of talked about the history, how it got founded, you know, all that kind of stuff. But um, really, you know, there's there's a discussion here just in talking about what what even is Amtrak? Um, because it's kind of different, right? Um, Amtrak, much like the U.S. Postal Service, um, is not entirely private, nor is it entirely public. It is a weird sort of hybrid. It is a quasi-semi-private corporation. And that means a lot of different things. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it becomes a much more complicated arrangement than if it was fully operated by the government or fully private. Right. Yeah. So like 
Amtrak, um, for example, um, is largely funded by the federal government um, through various sort of grants and through the U.S. Um, Department of Transportation and U.S., um, which then controls the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, they are also semi-independent, wherein they have to pay for a lot of things themselves off the backs of the, sort of what they're able to take in. And as you can imagine, um, this sort of system creates a lot of inefficiencies in sort of how they're able to adapt and um, really progress as a as an agency. Um, and so um, I have it here in my notes that Amtrak is required by law to, out, to operate a national route system. Um, however, they obviously they're not in Hawaii or Alaska. Alaska does have a rail system, but it's uh, I believe it's called Alaska Rail. Um, they are fully separate from Amtrak. Um, but there's two other states that Amtrak actually doesn't operate in at all. Um, and that would be Wyoming and South Dakota. Um, so, you know, whether so it is coast to coast, it is broadly national, um, but there are gaps um, in the service. Um, it does service the District of, District of Columbia, as we um, as we know, through the Metro line. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then Amtrak services uh, will largely fall into uh, roughly three groups um, okay. per their website. So they have um, short haul service. Um, this would be mostly on, along the Northeast Corridor, right? So short haul being, you know, traveling from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, um, Baltimore to Wilmington, Wilmington to Philadelphia, right? These are relatively quick trips. It does not take that long, especially if you're on an Acela, although it's not only Acela. Um, there's a lot of trains that run along that a lot of Amtrak routes that run along the Northeast corridor, um, that will take you, you know, not that much time at all to get from Washington DC to Baltimore is, well, I don't know exactly. I don't have it in front of me, but I would wager 30 ish minutes, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm not sure what it's like today, but I remember that being 45 minutes or an hour or something like that. Yeah. I don't... But rel like, you know, within the the confines of a, a day trip uh, of right. commuting patterns, that kind of thing. And that's sort of what they're getting at. So this is really the only area in the country that Amtrak sort of runs this, um, a commuter sort of level of service. Um, there are other commuter rail services in the country, right? There's in LA, there's Metrolink, I think is, is what it's called, um, where you can take a train from, you know, Riverside, California, which is, you know, pretty far you know inland and you can take that into la um and that'll be a little bit more efficient than driving certainly with la traffic um but that's not part of amtrak so it's it's its own commuter thing it's also relatively confined to the metro area um the other one is um uh there are state-sponsored short haul services um so these would be um kind of similar to what we have here in the Pacific Northwest, which is the Amtrak Cascade. Okay. Which, while well, it has the Amtrak branding, um, and it is largely facilitated by um, Amtrak in terms of, you know, you go and you buy your tickets through Amtrak.com to go from Portland to Seattle. Um, it's really the Oregon Department of Transportation, Washington Department of Transportation, and then it goes up to Vancouver. So the... Um, I don't know, Ministry of Transportation or whatever they call it up in British Columbia, um, that operates that that rail. So that means they buy their own rolling stock, their, their own trains. Um, they do all their own hiring through the state DOTs um, and that kind of stuff. And um, of course, all the tracks are owned by freight companies. And then, of course, all the tracks are owned by freight companies, which we're going to get to in just a few minutes. Um, and then finally, Amtrak um, uh, has a medium and long haul service. Um which is, you know, sort of known as their national network. So you can go on to Amtrak and they, they offer a, a number of very lovely packages um, for you to travel across the country and train. And I think to sort of their selling point, a lot of these trips are very beautiful. And so you can go from just something, I think it's called the Empire Builder, where you travel from Chicago to Seattle. Which is a bit of an infor unfortunate name for the line, I think, in some ways. Oh, but yeah, maybe it's <laughs> apropos, maybe it's apt, you know, as well. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I think, you know, the idea is that this is a multi-day trip. Um, and so it's more of a, I think what they're trying to sell it as is more of like a luxury kind of cruise kind of experience. You're going to see a part of the country that you normally wouldn't see um, under a timeline that's, you know, 
sort of leisurely um and it does it takes a few days um so yep. if you if you opt for one of these services you know and you have the means to do so probably get a sleeper car um you don't have to um but i imagine it would be a lot more comfortable <laughs> um and so that that's really it Th those are kind of the three sort of chunks of the three buckets of amtrak today um and in exchange for this, you know, uh, Amtrak receives federal funding for the vast majority of, of its operations. Um, but the Northeast Corridor and Acela specifically is their only profitable corridor. So every other corridor that Amtrak runs, including the state sponsored ones. Right. So if we look at Cascades here, um, these all run at broadly a loss. They all lose money. Yeah, they all lose money. They're not they're not making anybody money, um, which is part of the problem. And we're gonna get to that. Um, I think maybe more next week um, around the economics of of rail. Um, and so, yeah. So there's there's a number of of, of routes that go across the country. Um, there's a really fun, you know, map that Amtrak has on its website, um, and you can kind of look at it. I think there's one on Wikipedia as well. Um, and it does hit a lot of places. Right. You can technically go to a lot of different um, places in the country on on Amtrak. Um, however, sometimes it can be a little misleading because Amtrak for as, you know, as, as good of a service as it might be, you know, in certain locations, certainly in the Northeast Corridor, um, you know, it has a lot of faults. And so one of those faults is that um, oftentimes Amtrak will shunt people. They'll you'll let's say you're taking it from New Orleans to Chicago. Um and you know you take the train from new orleans up to memphis tennessee and what it'll do is it'll shunt you off the train and onto a bus service it's like a it's like a connecting service right where it's still technically an amtrak contracted service therefore it's still an amtrak but you're no longer getting that train experience and so you know you you lose a lot of the experience when you do that and the reason why they have to do this is because of how rail is owned in this country um so if we look at all of the vast amounts of rail in, in the United States, the vast, vast, vast majority of it is owned by freight companies. Um, it is not public. It is not Amtrak. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the freight industry, uh, I'm not sure exactly how they came to own most of it. Because um, again, if we look back into the 18, mid 1800s, a lot of this was subsidized in the beginning. So it was probably some sort of well, this relates to the giving of land to the companies that built the trans uh, transcontinental railroad. So mm -hmm. that's that's one of the moments in which the freight companies they have ownership not only of the tracks but the land that it's on. So even for example, in Portland, you know, some of the train tracks that go through the city are the city doesn't have purview over that particular right. strip of land because that belongs to the rail companies. Belongs to the rail company, which is then overseen by the Federal Railroad Administration. So, you know, even the state of Oregon only has so much power to force, you know, changes to how that rail is operating within, you know, a very dense area of Portland, for example. Um, yeah. 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 And because the freight companies own the tracks, the, the freight traffic has the privileged spot on the track. So right. if you're going from Portland to Seattle, for example, and some people, many people listening may have had this experience, it, it might take longer than estimated because if freight traffic is, uh, you know, at a particular moment, then the Amtrak, you know, the Cascades basically has to wait for the freight trains to go by. So it doesn't have... Um, the ability to to maintain its schedule always because of that, right? Yeah, yeah. So it just exactly to your point, uh, you know, a Amtrak train going from one city to the next um, at a scheduled time of you know, let's say five hours, um, could turn into something more like six, seven, or eight hours um, if a freight train comes along. And I think we've all experienced just how long and meandering and slow freight trains can be. Um, they sometimes they just straight up stop right and all of a sudden that throws a wrench into how amtrak is able to run right and if you don't have that reliability of service you don't have the convenience of service um that impacts the overall desire for that service and it's not predictable and it's so, not predictable yeah that, yeah yeah um so that's a huge issue um of 
sort of where and how passenger rail can go today. Um, now, if we go back to the Northeast Corridor, um, uh, Amtrak does own the majority of its rail connecting Washington, D.C. to Boston. I think it's about 460-ish miles of rail, of which um, somewhere around 90 of that is still owned by freight companies. So, um, well, that's great. Uh, Amtrak has a lot more autonomy and authority over over that area. Um, sometimes those trains do get um, held up by freight still, which is, again, just very unfortunate. Um, and, you know, Amtrak has, you know, projects here and there where they're trying to shift this a little bit. I know, for example, here up in the Pacific Northwest, um, they have a number of projects that sort of are building out their own rail to get around sort of no, well-known freight pinch points. Um, and, and I think to to their credit, I know, you know, if you were to take the Amtrak Cascades, the one that connects Eugene, Oregon, up to Vancouver, BC, um, they have far fewer frequency uh, delays than the Amtrak Coast Starlight, which goes from LA to Seattle. Um, and it's, I think it's just because the regional state-owned um, rail is able to better plan and... Um, uh, get around any potential freight delays. Um, but oh, I think that's about it for, for our history episode. <laughs> we, we said a lot. Yeah, I think, I mean, of course there's a lot more and this could be, this could go on. We could go into more detail, but hopefully this gives listeners a, a nice template to understand what's going to come next week and you know why, how we've gotten to this point and it will be much more meaningful to talk about, possibilities for high-speed rail having all this uh, background established exactly yeah so next week we will um we're going to dive you know head first into high-speed rail right so we've talked a lot about sort of regular speed rail we talked a little bit about the acela which we're going to talk a lot more about next week um next week we're just going to start talking about sort of what is high-speed rail how does it work who has it um why doesn't the us have it very much um what does it mean? What can it do? And then we're going to get into our sort of what ifs um, around what if the United States had a high speed rail system. Um, and so with that, Hunter, you want to plug your pluggables? Sure. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I'm co-author, along with David Bannis, of Portlandness, a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. Yeah. And uh, once again, my name is Jeff Gibson. You can find me on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash the last sign geography by Jeff. That's G-E-O-F-F. -F. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, instagram.com slash geography by Jeff or Substack, geography by Jeff dot uh, Once again, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please uh, review this podcast. I don't know if that changes how we're ranked in Apple Podcasts. I have no idea what it does. But, you know, I figure why not ask people if you're liking this to yeah, Help please consider that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess with that, we will catch you uh, for the exciting conclusion one week from today. Thank you for listening. Thank you.